recognized as an international Thank you so much, Marcy, and good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled and encouraged by your turnout tonight. Uh, you braved a rather difficult weather to come and hear a subject that many people don't want to hear about. And the weather would have given you an excellent excuse to stay home. So I'm really thrilled that uh, so many people have come. You know, a number of years ago, I was giving a, delivering a lecture out in eastern Pennsylvania to a number of therapists and other people interested in the community about alcoholism and drug addiction. And uh, after I was introduced, I got up to the microphone and I said, um, alcoholism and drug addiction are a disease. And then I went and sat down. And you know, pretty soon everybody began looking around what's, what's happening. So after letting them, you know, sweat a little bit, uh, okay. After uh, letting them fidget around a little bit, I got back up and I said, now look, if uh, I hadn't said anything more today, all of you would have felt that you've been gypped. Right? You came to hear a lecture and you heard four words. Right? But I'll tell you this much, that one phrase, alcoholism and drug addiction is a disease, would have stayed in your mind. Now, if you listen to everything else I say, and you carry it away, but you don't remember that alcoholism and drug addiction are a disease, your time has been wasted. And if you'll recognize that they're a disease, then whatever else you hear or you don't hear is of secondary importance. Oh, by the way, I don't know, I, I did want to mention you, I don't know if anybody noticed that there was a little bit of commotion here earlier uh, with an ambulance or whatever. There was a young woman who was injured in playing basketball. And uh, that's why she had to be taken to a hospital. Well, so there's something that I don't understand. When I was a youngster, during summer, there was a polio scare. This was before the polio vaccine. And if there were three cases of polio in the city, right nearby here in Milwaukee, if there were three cases of polio, the community went into an alarm reaction, like for a terrorist attack. Huh? Swimming pools were closed. Huh? Parents were warned not to let their children go into theaters or other assemblies where there's many people. All because it's a contagious disease. And all of that happened because of three cases. When it comes to chemical dependency, and chemicals is alcohol and drugs. Oh, and by the way, nicotine is a chemical. But when it comes to chemical dependency, there aren't three cases. There aren't 30 or 300. There's more than 3,000 cases in the community. And nobody's getting alarmed. 
Nothing's happening. Why? I met with a, young, with a group of young people in recovery, all Jewish kids, incidentally, Jewish adolescents. And I said to them, you know, there's something I don't understand that maybe you can help me understand. I have a great deal of respect for what nature does in how it helps us defend against injury. And uh, we do things reflexly without thinking because nature has instilled that within us. So if somebody throws a rock at our head... I'm going to ask you to get a little closer to the mic because people are having trouble hearing you. Okay, but if we make it too much louder, then we get to... Well, that's why I'm going to ask you to get closer to the mic. Okay. If uh, somebody throws a rock at your head, reflexly, without thinking, you put your hand up. Well, wait a moment. The rock's going to hit your hand. It's going to break your hand. It's going to fracture your wrist. Why do you do that? Well, it's because you value your brain more than your hand. The hand is important, but it doesn't compare with the brain. So reflexly, to avoid the brain from getting injured, you put your hand up. That's a natural reflex. And so I asked these youngsters, where was your natural reflex to prevent these terrible toxic drugs from damaging your brain? And no one had any answer. And I told them what the answer was. You can only put your hand up to protect it if you see the rock coming. Right? If you have no awareness that there's a rock coming, you don't protect yourself. Now, the Torah says that a judge is not permitted to take a bribe. Because if the judge takes a bribe, it will blind him so that he will not be able to see the truth, he will not be able to see the facts. We are vulnerable to being blinded. And when we don't see something, we can't defend against it. And the reason that we don't have the alarm reaction to alcoholism and drugs is because we've denied they exist. And if they exist, they exist somewhere else. They don't exist with our families. They don't exist with my kids. We have a wonderful home. My child isn't going to be affected. My son, my daughter, they're going to very good schools. Whatever it is, whether it's a secular school or a religious school, they're not going to be affected. But remember... If alcoholism and addiction are diseases, diseases do not discriminate. Now I know when many of us grew up, if we grew up in homes where there was Yiddish little slogans and phrases, we may have grown up with the myth that shikr is a goy, right? and drunkenness is not a Jewish problem. Well, I don't know whether that was true a hundred years ago, but even if it was true a hundred years ago, it is no longer true today. Okay. We have a abundance of alcoholism in Jews, and I don't need statistical studies to prove it. The proof of that is in the country clubs who 40 years ago refused to take bar mitzvahs and Jewish weddings because the country clubs make their money on the alcohol, not on the food. Today they are clamoring for Jewish business. Uh, the best evidence that we've graduated into drinking. And I'm not talking about L'chaim drinking. Right? There is nothing wrong with an individual who is not an alcoholic to take an occasional L'chaim. That's not the problem. The problem is when alcohol becomes a way of living and becomes the mainstay that allows a person to function or not to function as it were. And the same thing is true of other drugs. There's an unfortunately a myth that marijuana is safe. Because I know people who have had used marijuana for 20 years and they didn't get any serious effects. Not true. Marijuana is a deadly drug especially for young people. There are young people who have fallen victim to the a motivational syndrome, which means that marijuana takes their motivation away and they drift and they do nothing. And they lose the most precious years when they could have gotten their education and prepare for themselves, prepare themselves for life. 
in getting an education, getting a profession. And they may wake up when they're 32 or 33, and they can still pull, do something to salvage themselves, but the best years of their life have gone. Marijuana is a deadly drug, and don't let anybody fool you otherwise. Now, it's not deadly in the sense that cocaine and heroin is because nobody drops dead from uh, marijuana, but it has a delet very deleterious effect anyway. And certainly, drugs such as the painkillers, the narcotics, whether it's heroin or Oxycontin or whatever else happens to be around, Percocets, that are abused. Because prescription drugs can be every bit as dangerous as the narcotics. Three weeks ago, I was in Israel, and the community was shocked by two events that happened very close together. One was a young student who died from an overdose, not of narcotics. He died of an overdose of Valium. And the other thing was that four yeshiva students were arrested for peddling marijuana to their friends. And they told the officers that they were selling them to hundreds of Jewish kids. A lot of them American kids who had gone to Israel because Israel is the place to go. And I would love to say that Israel is the place to go. But we have to be extremely careful because the problem of drugs in Israel is significant. And so what happens is that when we don't see the rock coming at our heads, we don't block it. And when we are blinded because we don't want to see alcoholism or drugs in our community, we don't go into an alarm reaction, we don't protect ourselves. And what you've heard before in the introduction is the fact that there are a number of services developing to provide treatment, whether it's residential treatment, outpatient treatment, aftercare, whatever it is that is necessary. But there's one catch. I think that we will be able eventually, we will eventually be able to overcome some of the denial because when a person gets into trouble with alcoholism or drugs, there's not going to be much option. They're going to have to do something. The problem that we have is twofold. First of all, in the Jewish community, any kind of psychologic, psychiatric problem, let alone a drug and alcohol problem, is a shande. Now, a shande is not a disgrace. A disgrace is nothing. Yeah? I mean, say, oh, it's a disgrace. That's not how you say sh it's a shande. Right? Just the tone of it tells you what it is. Right? So how can you possibly admit the problem? So what happens is that a youngster or an older person who has a problem has to be sent away 100, 200, 1,000 miles away so that, God forbid, nobody should know the problem exists in the family. Then I have had calls where I said, uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, I have to get help from my husband. He became addicted to cocaine. I said, well, more than happy to take care of him. This was in my center in Pittsburgh. There's all oh, we can't send, you can't go to Pittsburgh because I know you have other people from New York there and they'll recognize him. I said, I'll give you the name of a place of an Arizona. But don't be surprised if your next door neighbor is there. <laughs> but that's the way the logic goes. But it goes even further than there. Okay, the child, the husband, the wife, whoever has the problem may get into treatment. But that's not enough. Now, families do not cause addiction. Don't let anybody tell you anyway. Now, the alcoholic will be the first to say, well, if you had my wife, you'd drink too. But families do not cause addiction. However, oxygen does not cause a fire. Now, we've got a room full of oxygen. Nothing's on fire. However, if a fire does occur, the way you put out the fire is by depriving the flame of oxygen. You smother it. If it's a little fire, you smother it with a blanket. If it's a larger fire, you pour water on it. And the reason water douses a, uh, extinguishes a flame is because it deprives access of oxygen. Families do not cause addiction. 
but they may be the oxygen that allows the addiction to occur. Which is why it is crucial that if anyone has a chemical dependency, no matter what it is, whether it's alcohol or drugs, and they go into treatment, it's absolutely crucial that the family gets into treatment. Because if the family's going to stay aside and say, no, it's his problem, it's her problem, then they're con going to continue to provide the kind of environment that will allow alcoholism and drug addiction to continue. So, yes, treatment is available. But I think that the finest of treatments and the finest of therapists for any addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs or gambling or whatever, cannot have effective results without involvement in a support group. And the finest support group that I know of is the 12-step support group, which is either Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Al-Anon, Naranon, and for Gamblers, Gamblers Anonymous, and uh, the other addiction of these similar 12-step anonymous programs. Now, there's been a problem that some people say, well, I can't go to a 12-step program because it's not a Jewish program. I'm not sure why it's not a Jewish program. There's a gentleman in uh, recovery who is a very fine cartoonist, and so he drew a little cartoon where it's evident that the person speaking is a rabbi, you know, with the rabbi's garb, and he's talking, and the rabbi's talking on the telephone. And he said, we should have a AA meeting in our shul? No way. AA is a goyish program. How do I know? Because all the meetings are in churches. Right? Well, all the meetings are in churches because the shuls did not welcome them. Okay. Uh, I heard him something worse, which is unfortunately uh, uh, true, and it's, it's a sad fact. When he has in another cartoon, of course AA is a goyish program. How do I know? They talk about God. Right? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You can hear a lot of sermons about everything. But sometimes you, know, you can hear many sermons where God isn't mentioned once. But I believe that the 12-step programs are crucial to recovery. And a while back, a recovering Jewish woman asked me for a spirituality guide based on uh, Jewish sources. So I wrote a book called Living Each Day. Or the little phrases, paragraphs of Jewish knowledge that are important to people in recovery. And I thought this is going to be of interest to people in recovery only. It has gone through five printings. And people who never heard about alcoholism have found it applicable to them. And the reason for that is that the same problem that the alcoholics have, the same problem that the addicts have are also true for the non-alcoholic and for the non-addict. And the same kind of help that is uh, uh, available and is effective for the alcoholic to recover can also be tremendously helpful for every man, woman, and child. And so when someone asks me, well, why do we have to have a 12-step program? Why don't we have something just based on Musa, on the Jewish sources of ethics? I said, you're right, we need that. So I wrote another book, which is, that's my addiction, writing books. <laughs> So I wrote another book called Self-Improvement, but I'm Jewish, you know. And I described the recovery program based on Jewish sources. And then at the end I say, now turn the page and read the 12 steps. It's identical. I've learned so much from the 12 steps. And I can't go into the, a, a, a long discussion of that. It is an extremely helpful program. But we do have to have the families involved in Al-Anon, the family groups of Al-Anon and Ar-Anon. And if you think there is resistance to get an alcoholic to get into treatment, just think what kind of resistance there is for the family to go to a group where, God forbid, somebody will see that Mrs. Cohn or Mrs. Goldberg or whatever is at the family group, and that means that she's got an alcoholic in the family or she's got a drug addict in the family, and the Shonda factor takes in. Now, I understand that. 
I mean, I lived in that culture. But it's time that we get oh, over, overcome that and realize that if it's not going to be exposed in that way, it's going to be exposed in a much worse way. Alcoholism and drug addiction are progressive diseases. They don't stand still. They have behavioral manifestations. Okay? And if we don't tackle it in the early phases and do what is necessary, then yes, the family can cover up the fact that there's a drug addict in the family. They only can, and, the fa and, and that the family's name should be known. But only until such time as he's arrested and his name gets into the paper. Just a few weeks ago, there was an arrest at a party in New Jersey okay, where 40 kids from the finest families were arrested in a uh, drug party. And these kids said, what do you want from us? Our party was very mild compared to the others that are going on. We're talking not about three cases of polio. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of homes that have been affected. And because you're here tonight, you're going to be walking out with a responsibility that you didn't have before. Because maybe when you came here, you thought, oh, it doesn't happen that much. Maybe here and there, a, a, a isolated case. And it's not really my problem. And I think it's all of our problems. Because if it doesn't affect us immediately, it can affect our children, it can affect our grandchildren. And is a con it is a contagious problem because the kids pick it up from each other. So I encourage you to be of support to the organization to help enable them, it's going to be financial commitments as well, to enable them to do whatever they can, and they can do a great deal, to bring services, treatment services, to the community at large. Those who have any interest at all, personal interest, please resurrect the JAX program locally. The JAX program is a spiritual support uh, group for Jewish alcoholics and chemically dependent people and their families and it was once very active so for some reason or other it faded and it's now time to resurrect it we have to have a nucleus this doesn't take the place of the 12-step program but it does provide a source of spiritual knowledge and spiritual strength uh, for the Jew in addiction okay I think that's about all I want to say about treatment okay? there are treatment facilities there are treatment sources you can call Marcy, you can call whoever else is with the organization to find out where a person can get help and that families too should be involved. Now I want to talk about something else. The great progress that medicine has made has not been in treatment. Treatment has been very effective in various diseases. But the greatest progress that medicine has made in the past 50 years even greater than antibiotics and even greater than cortisone, has been an effective prevention. I remember when I was a kid, and some of you may remember this, that walking to school and seeing signs on the house, quarantined mumps, quarantined chicken pox, quarantined measles, quarantined scarlet fever, you never see those. I had them all. Somehow I survived childhood. But what's happened is, all of these conditions have been eradicated by effective immunization. You know, your grandchildren aren't going to have a little pockmark over here from smallpox vaccination. We've done away with it. You're not going to have a polio scare during this summer. So medicine's great advance has been in immunization, improved hygiene, improved nutrition. What about addiction? How do you prevent addiction? Now, first, let me tell you how you don't prevent it. Don't try to scare the kids. It doesn't work. Uh, we have had situations where youngsters have seen their friends die from heroin and cocaine, and it didn't faze them. Kids are not scarable. There's going to have to be another approach. And I'm not sure that, that there's, I, I don't know that there's anything that is a surefire thing that is going to be 100% effective. But we're going to have to do something 
about the quality of life that's going to discourage kids from looking for a high, for looking for a thrill. Because kids essentially do what the adults do. And our adult life has become very much involved in not what the fathers, founding fathers said in the Declaration of Independence when they said life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. In modern culture, it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of pleasure. As though happiness is pleasure. And everybody is after getting more and more pleasure out of life. I'm not a killjoy. I don't want to deny anybody of pleasure. But I think it's a mistake that pleasure should be the goal in life. Now, if you have a goal in life, an ultimate goal, and while you're working to that ultimate goal, you want to have pleasure, please be my guest. I'm not a killjoy. I put chocolate syrup on my vanilla ice cream. Right? And I don't deny anybody the pleasures of life. Right? But don't make pleasure the goal in life, which is what our culture has done. There has never been a hedonistic culture like ours. I remember back as a kid, back in the 1930s, nobody could have thought that life is to be pleasurable. There was just too much misery around. Yeah. You know what happened on a very hot day? You sweat. Yeah. Who would sweat the day on a very hot day? You go into air-conditioned room. I mean, one after another, science and technology have given us such wonderful, wonderful advances that have taken away the misery of life that now youngsters grow up believing life is to be pleasurable and I have had my share of it. Right? And I want my share of thrills. And so they go for the alcohol, they go for their marijuana, they go for the pills. And we're going to have to start showing them in our own families that there is more to life than just pleasure. The problem is that I don't want to knock science and technology. I think they do great. But if you've watched television, and I suggest you do this, take a little tablet and watch whatever it is, an hour of television, and look at how many commercials tell you about how to get more fun out of life and more pleasure out of life. And this is what is just thoroughly uh, saturating our culture. It can go to such mishugas uh, that we don't even know what, what, we're, what we're looking for anymore. Oh, by the way, do you know that back in 1930, when there were so many hardships in life, somebody could have said, Oh, I know how life can be made happy. Get rid of all these problems. Right? Conquer tuberculosis, conquer the childhood diseases, conquer infant mortality, conquer problems of communication, right? and everybody will be happy. Well, we've done it all. And here I defy anybody to tell me what kind of gadget technological advance can science produce to give us happiness? We've already got cell phones. Right? They make you miserable, but that's all right. They're, they're very useful. Right? We have the Internet, which has become a very serious problem because of people becoming addicted to Internet pornography. But think of what can there be. Now, I found the answer. I found the answer on the airplane the other day. I picked up the magazine, the Sky Mall, if you've ever picked it up, there are about 200,000 things that are advertised that I wouldn't need right? <laughs> at atrocious prices, and obviously people are buying them, all kinds of gadgets. But then I came across the thing that was the final blow. There is a television set that you can hang on the shower head so you can watch television while you're showering. <laughs> Now, there is no question in my mind that that will bring happiness to mankind. Right? Come on. Right? What are we showing our kids? Right? More and more, more and more ways to, of, 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 of pleasure. I was at a banquet one evening. It was a tribute to 
a volunteer group, a very interesting volunteer group. This was made up of people of all ages, all the way from older adolescents to retirees. And what they would do is that they would provide companionship to an elderly person who was shut in in their apartment. There are some elderly people, right? widows, widowers, they may be in their late 70s and their 80s. Many of their friends have died. Right? Their children live hundreds of miles away. They are alone. They can't get around very well because of their vision. They can't drive. Their hearing is poor. They can't ambulate well because of arthritis or whatever else. So they're locked in, in their apartment. They are shut-ins. Terribly lonely. And so what these people have done is that they've found these people through various social agencies and they volunteered a few hours a week to spend time with these shut-ins. Get them out of the apartment. You know, take them to the supermarket or to the dentist or to the doctors or take them to the park or you know, spend an hour with them, reading to them. Some of them can't see the television well. It was a very interesting group. On the table was a little brochure such as this, and the theme of the evening was doing good versus feeling good. And as I sat there, I said, this is the answer to the problem of addiction. Let our families stand for something. Let the children know our family stands for doing good. There's nothing wrong with feeling good, but don't make feeling good the goal of life. Make doing good the fall of life. And you say, well, how should I do good? I'll give you a list of 20 things that you can do. Huh? Man, perhaps you want to uh, help f battle the, the famine in Ethiopia. Or you want to do something about acid rain. Or you want to do something about the environment. Huh? Or you want to be a big brother or a big sister. So there's all kinds of ways in which we can help. Or you want to sit with an elderly shut-in. And I was so enthused about that program that the next day I met with the parents of youngsters who were in treatment. And I said, I finally got the solution. What we've got to do is make doing good the focus of life rather than just feeling good. And I really put it on thick. And the next morning I walked in, the therapist says to me, you know, doctor, you really reached, reached everybody last night. I said, well, I'm glad I did. He said, yeah, after you left, you know, people were standing around and talking, and I heard him say, Dr. Tversky is absolutely right. We have to get after our kids to do more volunteering. <laughs> they didn't hear anything, did they? You don't get after your kids. You show them how it's done. So, yes, after you come home on a busy day and you're tired, right, show your kids that you want to do something rather than sit down in front of the television and kick off your slippers, which you're entitled to do. But show them that maybe once a week you go out for do some, doing something else. Maybe you show them that the precious Sunday afternoon on which you would like to have, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, which you would like to have some entertainment, that every once in a while you take off that Sunday. And then take the kids along. And show them what you're doing. Maybe you're t going into the hospital and visiting people who have no visitors. And bring them either flowers or a book or candy or whatever else it is. Begin to show kids how doing good is the focus. That's what this family stands for. The other thing that I think is extremely important is that so many young people who fall into the trap of alcohol and drugs have come from what we have to call, because there is no other term, dysfunctional families. Dysfunctional families. Now what is a dysfunctional family? I think that a dysfunctional family basically is one in which there is a lack of what in Yiddishkeit is known as shalom bayit. Right? The harmony and peace in the home. Where neither husband nor wife are trying to control one another. And there are so many homes which everybody would swear are peaceful. But they're peaceful because somebody is terrorizing or somebody's in control. And that's not a good lesson for the kids.
You know the story about the visitor to Soviet Russia and the official guy took him to the zoo and said, you're talking about the messianic age? Let me show you where the messianic age is. We've already reached it. And he takes him to a cage and he shows him a lion and a lamb in the same cage. Well, the person couldn't believe his eyes. Later on during the day, he mentioned to a friend, I actually saw it with my own eyes. A lion and a lamb in the same cage. So the friend looked around to make sure that the, nobody from the KGB was watching. And he said, they give him a fresh lamb every day. Yes, you can have a Shalom Bayis, right, where uh, there is peace because everybody is afraid to raise their voice. Because everybody's walking on an eggs because somebody is terrorizing the family. That's no Shalom Bayis. We want a Shalom Bayis where there is true respect, where there is a true love and respect for the other, between parents primarily. We want a Shalom Bayis where there are true examples of the character traits that Yiddishkeit talks about. Primarily the one being a control of anger, a control of rage. Right? I think that if we raise the, our voice in the house and lose control, that we have contributed to the children becoming disillusioned with a home life with Yiddishkeit and make them at greater risk. And it is even possible for a home to be totally observant and yet have people in control or people manifesting rage and anger. And it is just as important to have a uh, peaceful, harmonious life between husband and wife, parents and children, uh, as it is to do all the, to observe everything else in the Torah. I think it's important that parents should become educated about drugs and alcohol. Get the information. Find out what is marijuana, what does it do, what doesn't it do. Be able to converse with your children if they have questions. Make it so that the conversation is not going to be stopped when anybody talks about, I don't want to hear about that. Know about drugs. Become aware of the street names for them. So you know what the kids are talking about. Get information about what are some of the warning signs. Know who your kids' friends are. How many of us know the name, first names of our children's friends? It's important that we know who they're associating with. And it's important that the children know that if we are restricting something, that we are restricting it for their good rather than for ours. And it may be necessary for parents in a neighborhood to get together and hold a meeting together and say, we have one voice and we're going to speak with one voice, no underage drinking. Because otherwise the kid will say, what do you want me to do, not have any friends? All the other kids have parties at their home and their parents let them have beer? I'm not going to be an outcast. Don't you want me to have any kind of social life? And then they'll name you four other parents or ten other parents that allow beer in the house for underage drinking. And I think it's necessary that the community gets together. And that parents get together and say, we speak, we speak in one voice. Underage drinking is illegal. I think it's important to know what marijuana smells like. Otherwise, you'll have no idea what that strange odor is. And <clears throat> so we have to become educated. And we have to make a, our homes conducive with the relationship between parents and children that the children will not be afraid to ask. And to have an absolute truthfulness between parents and children. Sometimes I get calls from parents about... Um, uh, just one, the other one happened last week that uh, uh, the uh, parents called the young woman was manipulative and lying and, uh, and they were afraid of the kind of acting out that she's going to do. And they were so panicky that they were thinking of doing some bizarre things. Like, uh, I think maybe I ought to get a, a bodyguard 
uh, to accompany my daughter. I said, get a what? What's that for? What are you going to do? Uh, how are you going to explain that to her? Oh, I'll tell her that the, there's been death threats against the family. Uh, I said, first of all, leave the lying to her. Uh, don't lose her trust. And I think that if we can be absolutely truthful with our kids, and they'll learn to trust us, they'll learn to respect the truth. So sometimes we tell white lies. You know, kids are colorblind. Eh? If it's a lie, it's a lie. And if we can get away with a lie, then they think that they can get away with a lie. I think that there is, for some reason or other, I don't quite understand where our mentality is. I know we don't want to get arrested for speeding. I don't want a speeding ticket either. <clears throat> but because there's radar on the road, we get a radar detector. Right? Do you know what a radar detector is? It tells the kids it's all right to break the law as long as you don't get caught. It's a devastating kind of message. And yet, in all the magazines, you know, radar detectors are advertised. I mean, with that kind of culture, what do you expect? So we have to realize where our enemy is. Right? The culture is a chemical culture, pushing every kind of pill. And by the way, Valium is a medication. Let me suggest to you, don't take medications if you're not sick. If you're a little upset, you're not sick. If you can't sleep well at night, you're not sick. Eh? Leave the medications for sick people. And I once suggested to somebody who said, what can we do to prevent drug addiction in our kids? And I said, the first thing I'd like to do is let's go to all of our medicine tests and see what's, what, are, uh, what kind of medicines do we have. Do we have Xanax? Do we have Ativan? Do we have Valium? Right? Do we have sleeping pills? Do we have Percocet? Right? If you've got those medicines in your house and you're taking them because of not feeling good enough, that's a mistake. I've just got one more, a few more moments before we have to finish because the tape only lasts for one hour, right? <laughs> We've got 11 minutes to go. Okay. You know, I was once sitting at a dentist office, and I picked up a magazine, and I came across an article that said, How do lobsters grow? You know something? I couldn't care less. <laughs> I could have lived my whole life without wondering how lobsters grow. But I read them, and I said, Well, wait a minute. This is interesting. How can a lobster grow? A lobster is a soft, mushy animal, and it lives inside a hard, rigid shell, and that shell doesn't expand. Well, then how can a lobster grow? And the answer is that as the lobster grows, it begins to feel very confined because this shell is very confining. And when it's oppressive, so it feels uncomfortable. So it hides itself under a rock to protect itself from predatory fish, and it casts off the shell. And it grows a newer one. It grows a new shell, a spacious one, a comfortable one. But eventually, as the lobster grows, what happens? This new shell now becomes a confining and oppressive. So what does the lobster do? Back under the rock, throw off that shell, make a bigger one. And if that one becomes tight, back under the rock. What is it that makes the lobster go under the rock and throw off its shell? It is a feeling of discomfort. It is a feeling of being under stress. Now, do you know what happens if lobsters could go to doctors? As soon as they felt uncomfortable, they would go to doctors and they'd get a prescription for Valium or Percocet. <laughs> they wouldn't feel the discomfort. They wouldn't throw off the shell. The lobsters would die being two inches big. <laughs> there are kinds of pain that we should, should not have. There are serious depressions which have to be treated. But there's other kinds of discontent and dissatisfaction that are not illnesses. And when we feel those, we ought to think about, wait a minute, is this nature's way of telling me that I should be growing? And instead of trying to crush that feeling with a, some kind of medication, what is it that I need to be doing? And I think what you'll find invariably is that just as the body 
can have symptoms from being deficient in iron and vitamin C and vitamin D. We also have that part of our being which is not the body. You know, our body's an animal body. What makes us human beings is that we have some kind of vital force, some kind of spirit. Huh? That is not an animal kind of thing. And this spirit needs nutrients. And just as the body, if it doesn't get its nutrients, becomes sick, the spirit, if it doesn't get nutrients, becomes sick also. And the manifestation and the symptom is discontent and dissatisfaction. And I think that when we find ourselves being discontent and dissatisfied, we ought to look, hey, maybe I should be doing something to become more spiritual. And begin to look into what spirituality is all about. Some people think spirituality is only religion. Well, religion is wonderful if you don't limit it only to kinds of rituals. There's a great deal of spirituality in Torah, a great deal of spirituality in religion. But not religiosity. Not just behavior without a content of feeling, without a content of thinking about an ultimate goal in life and an ultimate purpose in life. And what am I supposed to do with these 80, 90 years that I'm here on this earth? And it has to do with doing good versus feeling good. And it has to do with becoming a better person. And doing something about ourselves to improve ourselves. All of these things are spiritual. And isn't it strange that sometimes the only people who go look for spirituality are people who are recovering from alcohol and drugs. And this is one of the reasons why I started my contact with Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous in 1961. And I've been going to meetings for 44 years, although I never drank and I never had a drug problem. Because at these meetings I see people struggling to get well. And as they struggle to get well, they find that they have to change their lifestyle. They have to be honest. They have to be frank. They have to make amends to people whom they've offended. They have to do a self-awareness search. They have to be conscious of what are their defects and how to overcome their defects. And this is what spirituality is all about. So I think that if we begin to pay attention to the phenomenon of chemical dependency, which is as common in Jews as it is in non-Jews, and even if it were not so, even if it were 50%, that still is an unacceptable amount. And we've got to re remember, there is no immunity. It could be our kids, it could be our grandchildren. And if we want to prevent it, we've got to do everything to strengthen the efforts in the community at battling the problem, to make treatment available, to have family groups available, to strengthen the 12-step program attendance, to get the shuls to open up their social halls to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous so that they don't all have to be in churches. All of these things can be done, but it requires a dedication and requires an effort. Now, you can all walk out of here tonight saying, he was right, this is what we should do, and two weeks from now forget that you ever heard it. That's not the way it should work. You've now got a responsibility having heard what you've heard. You've now, you now have a responsibility to do your share, to see that these efforts at helping our kids, saving our kids, saving marriages, saving families, saving the community, and that these methods be carried out. You've got an excellent organization that will help you and that will be your leaders in it. But they're going to need your support in every possible way. So, please, give your support to the programs. Uh, let their efforts be crowned with the success that only you can make available. And thank you so much for coming out to listen. I'm deeply touched by all you had to say, but especially the concept of doing good as opposed to feeling good. And my question to you would be, which of your many books would mostly uh, emphasize that particular point? Uh, I didn't want to make any commercial for my books. Um, uh, uh, probably if I had to choose one, I would choose Living Each Day as giving the, the most frequent messages.
Thank you, Rabbi. My name is Jim. I'm an alcoholic addict. Hi, Al. Hey, nice Jim. See you. I've heard you speak before, and um, I'm a member of the Clean Air Club in Highland Park, and uh, I've been in AA for many, many years, and I assure you that uh, most of the people that I go to meetings with every morning, 6.45, are Jews, and, uh, and it's uh, certainly an enormous uh, issue in the Jewish community, and um, I, I find that... Um, I had conversations with my children this morning, and uh, they were looking at the meeting list because I share that with my children now that, uh, unfortunately, I'm going through divorce, and, and my uh, wife uh, wouldn't allow me to share my uh, AA with my children, and uh, so I allow my children now to leave my big book and my 12 and 12 and, and uh, all of my literature out in, in my townhouse for them. My daughter said to me uh, today, she goes, Dad, um, why are all the AA meetings in the church? Uh, are you uh, are you uh, converting? Uh, and and it wasn't funny to me at all. And um, when I go to meetings in New York, there are a few meetings in the synagogue. When I go to meetings in LA, there's a few meetings in the synagogue. But it is a tremendous, tremendous uh, issue that there are so many uh, Jews on the North Shore that are in recovery, and yet no synagogues uh, open up their doors for us, or very few that I'm aware of to a meetings. The other comment I wanted to make, Rabbi, is that um, I'm someone who's struggled uh, with spirituality for all my years in the program, and um, my daughter was just bought mitzvah, and uh, quite frankly, when I'm in the synagogue, I feel nothing when I'm in the service, and, and you address that, and um, I'm trying to find a way. I, I find God, uh, you know, everybody please take their ears and, and right here. I find God when I'm on my knees in the morning asking for help. And those of you that are familiar with AA understand AA is, is based upon uh, sort of a Catholic uh, uh, upbringing. And, um, you know, I'm Jewish. I was bar mitzvah, but I don't find God, unfortunately. Uh, and the rabbi, if you heard him mention that God is very infrequently mentioned uh, oftentimes in sermons. And, in fact, what happens is it's oftentimes a cry for money to support the synagogue. So um, what I'm what I'm striving for, and I don't know anything about this, Jacks, but I certainly would volunteer. We have a, a lot of very active Jews on the North Shore, and, and I'm trying to find a way, and I've talked to my rabbi about it, and I haven't been able to find it yet, but I would love to be able to find a way to bring uh, my Judaism and my spirituality together, and I, I don't think I'm going to be able to find it in my synagogue on Friday night and Saturday morning. Thank you for your comments. The mic is live. And um, I live in Valparaiso, Indiana. Um, and regarding, you know, younger people and um, addiction, I started a um, an open speaker meeting in our high school three years ago. It took me a long time to um, have the school board let me do it because they said that um, we would come in, I would bring people from program to come in and they would teach the kids how to use with their stories. And it's amazing how, how much um, drugs are a huge problem in a small town like ours. Um, and finally they did, after someone would die from an overdose, I would go back to the school and say, can I do it yet? And finally they said, okay. And it has no authority in there. You cannot scare the kids. My, my question is, a lot of times I, I look at the kids at that high school level, and my son is in seventh grade. He just was bar mitzvah. And um, I, I say to the kids, just kind of bewildered, you know, like what happens between my son who's 13 and so afraid and, you know, so much doesn't want to use and you guys who aren't afraid anymore, you know, um, that's scary. But what I would ask you, Rabbi, is, I know it's probably a long answer, but do you think that there is a big um, issue of chemical imbalance and addressing that in adolescence and um, drug and alcohol addiction? There are some conditions which are due to a chemical imbalance, but I think that the overwhelming majority of kids who have uh, 
uh, alcohol and drug problems are not due to a chemical imbalance, but the fact that the kids are looking for the thrills in life that everybody else seems to have except them. Oh, and by the way, I was derelict in not mentioning, I just alluded it to it once, that the most common addiction of all is nicotine. And please be aware that everybody knows that nicotine is dangerous. Everybody knows that cigarettes kill. And that if you're taking a cigarette and you're saying, well, I know that it's dangerous, I know that it can give me a stroke, heart attack, cancer, whatever, but I need the effect of it, that is teaching the kids to ignore the effects of drugs and to use it for the feeling. Okay? So please, if you can possibly do anything to cut out the smoking, you're making a tremendous uh, progress and a tremendous uh, show for the children that you're willing to give up a pleasurable activity uh, because of the uh, addiction, because of the uh, danger involved. So I don't think that there is a chemical balance in most of the kids. Again, I think the kids are looking for uh, a, a thrill. I think that the problem is that, uh, as the young woman said, uh, her child is clean, but he is going to be associating with youngsters that are using. Now, the peer pressure is extremely uh, stressful and extremely uh, uh, effective. We have to have a kind of home situation which will overcome the peer pressure so that kids should really want the respect of their parents rather than the respect of their friends. And that's not easy to come by. I might tell you about one piece of research which has been done where these researchers went around from family to family, interviewed thousands of families, some of which had children with various kinds of problems, and some of which the children had no problems. And they fed all the statistics about these families into computers to see if the computers could point to any significant factor that distinguishes a healthy family from a problem family. Amazing what it came up with that the healthy families were those where the families had meal times together. Now, at least in a Sabbath observant family, at least the meals on Shabbos are together. But even that is not enough. I think that a great, if we can make the sacrifice in, in, in time and effort and get families around the table, uh, food is a great communicator. And to having pleasant conversations during mealtime, uh, according to this research, I think we'll be adding another conducive factor to the kids staying well. Hi, my name is Nicole Schwartz. I'm a broker summer. I'm a grateful recovery alcoholic. Hi. Hi. Um, I, 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 uh, first of all, it's an honor to hear you. Um, I'm one of the people who, one of the alcoholics who did try to start a dance program in Chicago. And um, two, two questions came to mind when you were talking about that. Uh, number one, when was the last time there was a dance retreat in Chicago or in the Midwest? And my second question was, um, I found a problem of, I found two problems when trying to find a place to hold meetings, which we ended up having in people's houses. So, number one, AA did not want us because although they have meetings for women, meetings for men, meetings for homosexuals, etc. They, you know, they don't want meetings based on religion because it's a spiritual program. And when I try to find a Jewish community, uh, places like this, which I can understand for safety reasons, they want your ID. However, we want to be anonymous in this community. And second, and I mean, when we try synagogues, you know, they they really didn't they, they didn't uh, want us either. Pretty much. So in your, in your um, experience with Jacks, where did they hold meetings? I mean, where's the place? Yeah, you see, the idea of Jacks is to be aware that Jacks is not a 12-step group. It's not AA, it's not NA, it's not Al-Anon. And AA and al is not, uh, uh, it's not a doctor's group, and it's not a lawyer's group, and it's not a Jewish group, and it's not a Christian group. Uh, it's a group of people who are interested in recovery. JAX is not that kind of group. JAX is to provide spiritual resources 
and there is no reason why there shouldn't be a Jewish group focusing on Jewish spiritual resources. Right? So uh, uh, I think uh, in New York, I think it's, it's fortunate that people do meet in the synagogues, they meet in uh, uh, Jewish centers, and uh, if enough pressure is put on, the synagogues will open their doors. It's been done, and uh, certainly the Jewish community centers could be available. Right? Keep up the good work. Hi, I'm Jeff Osias, and I'm a grateful alcoholic and drug addict. And this man made it work. Eighteen years ago, I met him as in dungarees, just getting into recovery. I was in a sweatshirt, dungarees, and I saw this guy. I saw him in a bathrobe and some kind of fur hat on his head, and I'm wondering, what in the heaven's name am I doing at a Jack's retreat? What is this stuff? He, I looked at him in the eyes, and for some reason, I drove up, and I didn't drive away. I don't know why. I drove my car in, I parked at the, the, uh, the home away. I came up, this man opened up his arms, gave me a hug, and I never left. God granted me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I'm shedding the shit. This, this microphone is louder, use that. Hello, my name is Michelle Gordon. Thank you very much. And I'm really there so water. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give myself a little bit of a plug before I ask my question. It's about, I'm a mother, I have five children, and I know heart, and um, I found that I take my children to the park a few times a week, and um, I'd like to, I don't really know any of you that well, but I'd like to invite any of you who would also like their children to participate with my children in physical activities, um, just, you know, soccer and, you know, baseball, basketball, after school, after supper. We're always available, um, and it's really been wonderful for my kids because it really gives them something that they, they do good then. It's, um, so... The reason why I guess I'm sharing this is because um, my family was broken up um, from drugs and alcohol, and uh, this this uh, sort of not only filled the void, but just sort of was a reality check that you know quality time with your children is really really important, and they really feel special and honored to spend time with with each other and with their friends and it's, it's really bonding when the kids get together and uh, just sort of um, get that steam off which they don't get off at school because a lot of times the recess is eliminated at school or there's just too many things to learn. So I really feel like it's a really big void in our community. And then secondly, I wanted to address sort of like the rites of passage when a boy becomes bar mitzvah and they're encouraged to drink lachayams and you kind of feel out of place when you go against the grain because <clears throat> you don't want to be isolated if you don't participate in it, but you know that it's really just setting them up for possible addiction or trouble. So how would a, a, you know, a mother address that and who doesn't want to be isolated from the community from not participating in it? As far as the last uh, observation is concerned, just this week, uh, I think we've begun to make some significant progress. Um, the Orthodox Union has come out formally condemning kiddish clubs in the shul. And this was where there was no harm in grown-ups taking a l'chaim. Uh, but uh, the kiddish club had, at many shuls, had excessive drinking. And the first step in, in, in the right direction is to cut out the excessive drinking in shuls. The next step is going to be to be extremely careful that uh, underage drinking does not occur, uh, neither at parties uh, nor in shul. The only exception I will make is, and even that doesn't have to be an exception, is that when the uh, chazan makes kiddish Friday night, and the children are given a tiny little bit of a sip uh, of wine. Ideally, they should use grape juice, which is much better. 
But if they're given just a tiny little drop of wine, I don't think that that is significant because it's not enough to give them a high. Uh, but in terms of, uh, uh, and even then it's better to use grape juice. And by the way, when Pesach comes, make sure that you have grape juice on the table. Uh, certainly there may be you know, relatives or guests that will not want to say that they can't uh, use alcohol. Uh, but I think that we've begun to make some progress uh, on it with the uh, outlawing of uh, kiddish clubs and uh, there will hopefully now that the uh, issue has come to the fore tragically as it has been uh, that there will be additional progress in getting uh, the uh, uh, underage drinking controlled. Do, do you think that it's appropriate to maybe tell the, the rabbi of the shul that I'm sorry? Do you think it's appropriate to tell the rabbi of the shul? I mean, what about being like not like cut off? Like it's, it almost limits you if you're at somebody's. I mean, well, so I think the, I think the rabbi has to hear it from the membership. He has to hear it from anybody. Now that doesn't mean that if you're going to tell him, he's going to listen. But at least at least it'll be a start. How do you tell your kids though, your boys who want to be friends with their peers, but they're drinking. Oh, I think that you've got to tell your children this is what this family stands for uh, and that we are in many ways different from the families around us and one of the things is that we do not allow, we don't approve of our kids drinking uh, underage uh, and other people do, that's their way of living, ours is different. And the way that you can strengthen that is by making your family ties strong enough that children will respect their parents, which is, you know, that's fallen away by the wayside ever since the 60s. But if we act, if parents act in a way to gain the respect and to gain the trust of their children, there's a much better chance that the children will, uh, there's nothing foolproof, but there's a much better chance that the children will accept that. Isn't there also a, a Torah theme that, you know, once a person's bar mitzvah, they become a man, and if you have a few lachayims, it opens you up, it lets all the... There is no Torah theme. Here there's the Torah theme that you become an... Uh, there's a Torah theme that you become an adult at 13, yes. But there's no Torah theme that says that you uh, become a uh, legitimate drinker at 13. Okay. Use this one, it's louder. Uh, hi, I'm Rob, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Rob. Uh, immensely grateful to be here and to be able to actually hear Rabbi Tversky in person, uh, having seen you on videotapes at Hazelden and a number of other treatment centers. It's wonderful to be in your presence. Uh, I know that I've been blessed to have a family that is immensely supportive. In fact, a couple of members of the family are here with me. Uh, we have grapefruit for me, excuse me, grape juice for me on Chavez and for the Sidorum. Uh, and it's my comment or question is not about that, but rather uh, in my program presently, I am experiencing some difficulties in moving through the third step, which uh, requires me to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him. Uh, one of the problems that I continue to run into is that it's difficult for me, even having gone through the Solomon Schechters and the Kambramas and uh, the high schools of Jewish study uh, to actually have that 100% belief that things are going to work out even though in the back of my head I know that they will but uh, it's a little bit different when push comes to shove at a set moment to actually take my will not take my will back and be patient with him and with his intentions and plans do you have any suggestions for someone like that? Yeah, there's no question that the kinds of things that happen, the kinds of things that happen can put a strain and a stress on our understanding of God. No one can possibly understand the Holocaust. Uh, although one can say, look, God didn't do that. Right? People did it and God doesn't interfere with people's free will. But what about a tsunami that kills 150,000 pe 150, people? I mean, these are things beyond our understanding. And yet we have to make the leap of faith in order to be able to keep our strength. Now, there's two things that I would like to respond to. One is a lesson that I got from a pediatrician's office. I was sitting in a pediatrician's office with my child, and there was a mother who had a little baby, roly-poly, lovely little child, probably around 10 months old or so. The kid was having a great time. And then, but the child was there for his third immunization. Okay? And children have a good memory. 
the white clad doctor walked out into the waiting room and the kid gave a shriek that you could hear down the block right? clung to his mother for dear life because he knows, he knows what's coming now uh, this is a monster that goes around stabbing people and making them sick for two days but then the mother picked the child up and is taking him into the treatment room and the child starts kicking the mother yeah. and the mother holds the child while the restrains the child while the doctor administers this this stabbing injury what's going through the child's mind the child can't understand my mother's the one who protects me she's the one who loves me how come she suddenly turned against me why is she collaborating with this monster right? and the child can't understand what happened but then the doctor injects the child and he walks away and what does the child do throws his arms around the mother wait a minute why are you turning to her for protection okay. she's the one who collaborated with the enemy to hurt you she's not reliable and the answer is <clears throat> that even though the child can't figure out possibly why the mother did what she did the one thing he knows is that the mother is his source of support and that's how we are with God I can't figure out what he does right? and sometimes what he does is it can be extremely painful but I still know that he's my source of support the other thing is something that I got from an AA meeting I was in Manhattan and it was one day when Murphy's Law was in full force everything from the morning on from the moment I got up everything was going wrong came 12 o'clock came noontime I was fit to be tied and I know that when I'm in a position like that I need a meeting so I called up and I found out that right within an area of four blocks there were three lunchtime meetings so I walked into a meeting and the young woman was speaking and she was telling her story a story that I've heard a hundred thousand times she started drinking when she was 13 and marijuana when she was 14 and then came the drugs and then came the whole behavior deterioration and all the horrible things that happened in addiction and then when she was 25 somebody brought her into Alcoholics Anonymous Narcotics Anonymous and now she's nine years recovered and everything is wonderful okay I've heard that before so it did nothing for me but then she said before I finish I have to tell you people one more thing she says I am a football fan I am a rabbit football fan the New York Jets that's my team and I will never miss a game but then there was one weekend that I had to be out of town and I didn't want to miss the game so I asked my girlfriend to record the game for me on her VCR when I came back I went to pick up the tape and she handed me the videotape and she says by the way the Jets won <laughs> well I still wanted to watch the game so I sat down and started watching the game and it was terrible the Jets were playing awfully they were losing and at halftime they were 20 points behind she says under other circumstances I would have been a wreck I would have been wringing my hands and pacing the floor and hitting the refrigerator she says I was perfectly calm I knew they were gonna win she says ever since I made a conscious decision to turn my life over to God I know that somehow it's gonna turn out all right and there are times when I'm 20 points behind at halftime right? but I know that it's gonna turn out all right now, I've never left a meeting without taking something along with me and I've taken that along with me and so many things happen in each person's life right, that you realize you're 20 points behind at halftime right? but you know that it's going to turn out right. Okay? Thank you. Hi, my name is Mitch. I'm a drug addict. Hi, Mitch. And you know people in this room, so you, you know, can't go out and say, I saw a Mitch at the J, just because he was a drug addict. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to meet you. Um, if I was ever going to meet you, I was going to ask you this question. Uh, I was an addict for 20 years, and I got into recovery, got it together, started living a much better life, and as a result of that, my wife was leaving, because she could only deal with me one way, now that I'm another way, she's leaving. So, here's my question, if God creates and controls all, do I have the right to be mad at God? 
you have a right to be mad at God? He's the only being at whom it's safe to be angry at. Right? You can't possibly hurt him. Right? Now, um, uh, look, I think that at times when there's an interesting thing in the Talmud that says that um, a person who is in anguish right, is never held culpable for how he feels about God. I mean, if you're hurting, that's what you, you can be angry at God. The thing is that we have to realize afterwards, after the acute pain is gone, that there is some kind of message for this whole thing that, we, that is beyond our understanding. And the one who really wanted to know why bad things happen to good people was Moses. And he, Talmud says that Moses asked God, why do bad things happen to good people? And God said, as long as you are inhabiting a physical body, you cannot understand that. After your life is over, you will understand that. Now, if Moses can't understand that, I'm not going to try. And the Talmud says that Moses wrote the book of Job, and you're familiar with the book of Job, as where Job was put through enormous, enormous suffering. Right? And everybody tried to explain it to him, and the explanations didn't hold water. Right. So, I can't explain why these things happen. Um, again, as long as you're hurting, if you want to be angry at God, that's your business. On the other hand, sometimes we have to realize that there are some things that we had some part in it, and that there are some things that we did, uh, whether we did it because of illness or whatever, that there's some things that we did that could have caused other people to... Uh, uh, to be alienated from us. And so, yes, there's some things that God does that we can't understand, but at the same time we have to realize that there's some things that we ourselves have contributed to. I know, I don't know. The question is, what about states that have legalized medical use of marijuana? I don't understand why that's ever been a problem. We've had medical use of morphine for 100 years. Right? And morphine is a much stronger drug than marijuana. Right? And it's under tight controls and it's only given when necessary. Right? But morphine is a legitimate medical uh, drug. And if marijuana has a medical use, then there's no problem with allowing marijuana to be put to medical use. The problem with California is that they did it in such a way that everybody from age three on can get marijuana. Right? And so it's, uh, uh, it was not for medical use, but just a subterfuge to allow wider use of legalized marijuana. But for actual medical use, I've got no problem with that. By the way, this gentleman and I go back about 45 years. I think a little bit longer. About 50. <laughs> a little bit longer. Uh, we were both at the Chicago Jewish Academy together in 1940, 43, 44. Yeah, that's about, I don't like to think about how long that's been. I uh, want to begin by thanking you for your leadership um, in many years. We met some years ago at a tax retreat in New York. Uh, my name is Heather Altman. I am a rabbi in this community and um, wanted to stand up here in service to let you all know that I have some experience in bringing program into synagogues um, and that started from me giving sermons um, that weren't only about addiction but worked addiction into sermons about many other topics. Um, my biggest reaction from sermons have been from my sermon on um, addictions in New York where um, the result was a check for grape juice for Kiddush um, in a show where that didn't happen yet. And the other biggest reaction was a sermon on uh, domestic violence that uh, re the reaction was my only piece of hate mail that I've received. So yeah, the reaction was what? Hate mail, ha hate mail that I've received. Um, well, you're lucky that you only got hate mail. I wrote the book on domestic violence in the Jewish community and I had death threats. Right, right. right. So I just wanted to point out the, the connection here of, of breaking the silence of, of any of the Jews. Um, we have an Al-Anon meeting at Amsterdam 
which was the result of people gathering. Um, I invited some people in recovery to my house for a Shabbat lunch. That's what they wanted to see. The next step was the 12-step Torah, which is a version of a jazz group that runs monthly here. Um, and I'm happy to be an advocate with, with anyone else in the community to work with your synagogues. The most important thing that Marcy um, said earlier is, in my opinion, that um, the ask comes from the people who are in recovery. Um, the synagogue board is not going to say, oh, let's have a, let's have a meeting. But if approached, um, they may be open to it. So um, you can reach me through on Shamit or through the Healing Network um, if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marty. Um, I feel like I was set up for this, uh, but I want to say by her because I, I'm in charge of facilities at Temple Menorah, which is right around the corner from here. And uh, we contacted uh, AA a few years ago and invited them to come to our building, and they never had to return my phone call. But we would be glad to have any kind of help or support group from the Jewish community or otherwise in our building. And if you're interested, just call the temple and give uh, the secretary my name, and we'll proceed from there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Trudy. I'm a recovering alcoholic, 37 years. Hi, Trudy. I have a major problem that's probably unique. I have 37 years of sobriety, and I'm being drawn to wanting to go and drink. I have had major, major problems, major things that are going on. Today, I have lost my belief in Torah because of an incident at Anshiyama that happened uh, because they do not want me as a Jew to practice there. And so I have lost my total belief in Torah. I do believe in God and I believe in the 12-step program. So one of the things I am going through right now is how, does, how do I connect? I have my program to a point. But there are times I feel like at this point in my life, being older, that uh, I'm, I'm being saying, well, maybe it would be better to go to a bar, to go drinking, because the Jewish religion doesn't care. And I have tried to get answers to certain things that happen. And I have been losing my belief in Torah, but not in God in my program. Do you have any advice for me? Well, first of all, uh, when you have a belief in God, then if you stay with it, look, there's also all kinds of drawbacks among people. You don't have to, you don't judge Torah by what people did. There's a wonderful woman who was a convert for about 26 years, and she got up and said, don't judge Judaism by Jews. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, uh, I think that people can do things, and it's not the Torah's fault that, be, that uh, some people behave the way they do, and I don't know what the incident that happened was, but that doesn't mean that you condemn Torah for it. But, the struggle that you're having now, the struggle that you're having now, I hope you do find your, your strength in God, but the, str the struggle that you're having now really can be very beneficial. Okay? My, one of my closest friends in the program, John, was uh, sober for, well, he died at age 83 after 42 years of sobriety. Uh, that one day John called me and he said, uh, can I talk to you? I said, of course. And he comes over and he said, I haven't had a day like this in 32 years. And I said, John, you mean you feel like drinking today? He says, yeah. I says, well, now that's wonderful. He says, why do you say that? I said, John, let me ask you something. How many times have I called you to ask you to give me the name of somebody to work with a newcomer? Oh, he said, you call me many times. And when's the last time that I asked you personally to work with a newcomer? He says, you never have. I said, didn't you wonder why? I said, you know, if I have a newcomer who needs help, this is somebody who's two days away from his last drink, a week away from his last drink, He's still shaking. He's going through the agony. Go, what are you going to do? You're going to tell him what used to be like 32 years ago? He's not interested in hearing that. Right? He needs help from somebody who knows what it is to struggle. You forgot that already. I said, you know, John, today is a refreshing day for you. Right? Now you're going to struggle again. So will you listen to me? He said, I'll do anything you say. I said, go to a beginner's meeting. Right? John went to a beginner's meeting, called me a week later. 
that his whole program is now refreshed. So if you're going through a struggle, take that as a good thing. You'll come out of it much stronger. Okay? Good. Good evening, Dr. Tversky. I know you from 1952. When I first moved to Milwaukee, I spent three years in your with Thomas Shearer, and then uh, your two sons, the two of your uh, brothers, uh, coached me to attend the yeshiva. Right now, I have four children. The, the youngest one became a rabbi. Wonderful. And uh, I have eight, uh, 12 grandchildren. They're all beautiful old people. And uh, I, the only reason I came here tonight is not because I, I have the alcohol problem, but I wanted to, I wanted to see you and hear you. But, and the, the, th the thing I got from your lecture is very important to me is in talking about shoulder bias. I recently had a stroke, and I'm home of the post of the day, and there was time that friction with your spouse. And I, I wish I, I shall learn from you to have to be a much better person. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, the program says that uh, we're supposed to get rid of resentments. I still have resentments against this guy. He beat me in every chess game we ever played. <laughs> Good seeing you, right? Come first. Oh, by, by the way, I, I'm still very close to your family. I attend the synagogue, which is run by your, by your nephew who right. me tonight. Right. And I live a block away from another nephew of yours. Wonderful. Good. Yes, sir. Thank you, Rabbi, so much. Uh, I do want to put a, a plug in uh, Temple Shalom on Lakeshore Drive in Addison that offers uh, recovery incorporated meetings. And the cornerstone of my recovery, I've been in AA and NA for 20 years, but until I began Recovery Incorporated, which was developed by Dr. Abraham Lowe in Chicago, and is worldwide, I didn't get a grasp on the second step, but it's offered as a nut and bolt approach to the second step, and it's miraculous for uh, crazy people like myself. Well, the gentleman is certainly not crazy, but I do want to tell you that Recovery Inc. is a very fine program especially to deal with people who have anxiety and phobias. Right? And the book, Mental Health Through Will Training by Abraham Lowe, it's now hard to get, you know, it's a book that's out of print, uh, is an excellent book. So thank you for your comment. And that is available on the internet at recovery, uh, www.recovery. Well, I tried to get it from Amazon and I had trouble. Okay. I also did want to ask, can a person go to too many meetings? Too many meetings? No, I don't think that there's such a thing as too many meetings. I do think we have to be careful that some people have said that, um, uh, usually somebody makes a comment about them, that their life has become so involved in the 12-step program that they don't have a normal life outside of that. Um, the 12-step program says we have to practice our principles in all our affairs. Right? So um, we can have a perfectly normal life living according to the way the, to the uh, practices of AA, and that does not mean that we become addicted to AA. Hi, Rabbi. Good evening, Dr. Tversky. We have seen each other many times. I've heard you speak, and not only here, but also at uh, Jack's retreats, and it's always been an educational experience. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to tell you that my former synagogue, I'm the rabbi with the best disease in the world. I have emeritus. And, and emeritus. We share that kind of thing, right? We're rabbi emeritus or medical director emeritus, and that's a nice way of saying you're over the hill, right? <laughs> and uh, my synagogue used to be a host to hijack. It is available again. There we are willing to have AA meetings. So please don't hesitate if you need a rabbi or if you need a synagogue rather to have a meeting place. It's Congregation Gate of Jacob and Samuel. It happens to be Orthodox. Sometimes that scares other Orthodox people away, but it shouldn't because we are here in order to get well. And once we are here to get well, 
then we belong together and we can do it together better than do it singly. It's on the barn in Longdale. You're always welcome to come. Please uh, don't hesitate to call either the Rabbi Emeritus or the present Rabbi today. I have a couple of uh, remarks. Number one, I want to commend uh, Rabbi uh, Heather Alton for the wonderful work she's doing at Anshe since hijacks for a while has not been existing in Chicago. And I wish her all the best success, and she needs to be strengthened by the rest of the community. So therefore, Yasha Koach, and we'll be glad to work together with you. Dr. Tversky, you talked at the beginning when you spoke about addiction as if it's mostly children. I'd like to emphasize that addiction is a disease not only for the young, but also for the old. Of course. It may start young, but sometimes it starts later. But it is a, it, it is a disease that all of us need to be concerned with. The second thing I'd like to mention is that because I'm a Torah observant Jew, does not mean automatically that I'm not going to ever get sick with addiction. And let's not say it's the other one. That's denial, of course. The other ones are the ones that are going to get addicted. I'm not going to. My family isn't going to. My shul isn't going to, etc. And so we need to know that. It's not an automatic thing. We have to do something with that Yiddish guy that we have in order to keep us away from these kinds of illnesses. I'd like to re-emphasize, because I'm also a rabbi, the Dalit Kosov question. It's serious. And those of you who are familiar with halacha, you will find that the question of the four cups of wine on the nights of the Seder are serious considerations. But, what do you do with a child that has diabetes? Do you give him sweets? So if somebody has an addiction of alcohol or some other drug, and you don't want them to get further into the addiction, then you don't give them wine. Then you don't give them any kind of hard liquor. And indeed, if grape juice is not the thing that they can drink, and ask a local rabbi to give you some advice, how can you be Makayim the